Hi, I'm Jerry Green, the President and CEO of the Pacific Council on International Policy. I'm very pleased to welcome you to our event, How Could Less Red Tape Make Societies More Equal? We're proud to partner with Zocalo Public Square to present this conversation. The Pacific Council is an international affairs organization focused on the global role of Los Angeles. If you're interested in learning more about what we do, please feel free to visit our website, pacificcouncil.org for information about our upcoming events and membership. I wanna thank you and, and, and um, wish you a very um, pleasant and fascinating discussion, which I am sure you will experience. Hello and welcome. I'm Sarah Suarez and I'm the programming manager at Zocalo Public Square. At Zocalo, our mission is to connect people to ideas and to one another. Everything we do is free and everyone is welcome. We publish original writing and we present conversations like this one. You can find us at ZocaloPublicSquare.org and on all the major podcast platforms. And if you enjoy today's conversation, you can like it, follow us, or subscribe to our newsletter. We are really excited to partner with the Pacific Council on International Policy to present today's conversation. We're about to hear from Harvard legal scholar Cass Sunstein, who will discuss how bureaucratic red tape is a barrier to greater equality. Here to interview him is Nikita Stewart. She's the assistant metro editor of the New York Times, and she has received recognition for her coverage of homelessness, mental health, and poverty issues. Over to you, Nikita. Hello. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I'm so happy to be here myself. Thank you to Zozo Public Square and the Council for presenting this conversation. I'm excited to be speaking today with Beth Sennett, Ian Eagle Scholar, and Robert Walsley, University Professor at Harvard Law School. We're here with also the founding director of the Program on Economics and Public Policy. He was administrator of the White House Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs under President Obama, and he has advised the world the United Nations. The world and the many nations are involved in the cost. Cash is also the author several books, including Nudge, Too Much Information, and Noise of the Law and Human Judgment. His most recent book, which we're here to discuss today, is Sludge What Stops from Getting Things Done and What Do You Want? Published in the book by MIT Press. Well, um, Cass, let's get started. Um, thank you again for speaking to me today. Um, you know, you open the preface of your book by saying this book is a product of failure. Um, that's pretty succinct. <laughs> um, what is that failure and how do you define sludge? Thank you for that. And thank you for hosting me and uh, discussing this with me. Um, the failure is personal. It's not about someone else. It's about me, my failure. And when I worked under President Obama, I headed a little office called the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, which was created by the Paperwork Reduction Act, and one of whose functions really is to reduce paperwork. And I didn't get on that problem fast enough or aggressively enough. So some people may be surprised to hear there is a Paperwork Reduction Act. Uh, the fact is that under that law, uh, the, the office has a lot of opportunity to tell the Department of Transportation, the EPA, the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, stop imposing such paperwork burdens on people, back off. And while I did a little bit of that, it was, it was not enough. Uh, and that's partly the reason I did the book, a kind of uh, uh, redemption effort. Uh, with respect to the definitional question, sludge is like gunk, uh, yucky stuff that we encounter when we try to go about our lives. So it might be you're trying to get a cell phone plan changed. Yes, this is autobiographical and changed in just a little way, but it takes 75 minutes of trying to figure out a website or talk to an actual human being. And before you get there, you've actually exploded your whole morning. Or it might be that you're having a health problem and you need to have a doctor help you. 
and the number of forms you have to fill out, the things you have to do to get access to that doctor, even though you have, let's say, a good plan, or even though you have legal right to the to the doctor, it may be that the the frictions and administrative burdens are uh, just too much, and you give up at least on that day, and that might be a really important day. Or it might be that to exercise a constitutional right, let's call it the right to vote. It might be that there's a lot of sludge imposed on people, which might be paperwork requirements or waiting time or something else, getting somewhere, and that's sludge too. Dealing with a company when you have a concern, your employer, when you want your relationship with the employer to be a little different, getting your legal rights to be vindicated. It may be that the problem isn't the underlying right. The right might be great, but the sludge is what prevents you from enjoying the right. So um, I guess, why did you decide to write about sludge? It's one of those things that I think we all recognize, like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm on hold or... You know, I can't figure out this FAFSA um, <laughs> to all the parents out there. Um, but, you know, why did you decide to write a book about it? What are you trying to accomplish? I think there, were, there are two answers to this. One is very personal and the other is more kind of missionary. The very personal is that uh, sludge, whenever I encounter it, I feel why are they doing this to me? And I think I'm not unique in that. So if the question is, how can you get from here to there, where the there might be some relationship with a hospital, or it might be some relationship with the criminal justice system. And if you're faced with all this stuff, uh, that can be extremely irritating. And I thought I was not uh, unique in that. Uh, the missionary goal was the very term sludge, I'm hopeful, once it gets in one's head, it starts unifying a lot of things that we all experience that we don't really have a term for. We might think it's the phone company or our boss or our university or you know, the local medical facility or the legal system. But to see sludge as the unifying thing that we're encountering every time, there's something, uh, I think, organizing. It organizes our minds nicely. And it also, when I say it's missionary, it helps people get on a mission, whether they are objects of sludge or producers of sludge, to think if I'm an object, uh, I've been treated unfairly. And if I'm a producer, to feel, um, Maybe I can produce less. Well, you know, um, as a journalist, I, I've spent the last several years documenting poverty. And last year I was reporting on food pantries and I, I let my emotions spill over as I was talking to some of my colleagues and it was all recorded um, on the daily. Um, and what What's upsetting me is, and it still upsets me, is how bureaucracy strips people of um, their dignity and, and their time. Like you, you can't get time back. Um, how does sludge disproportionately affect people from low income households? Okay, I'm really grateful for that. So let's back into the question. That's a central uh, goal of the book to see sludge as a kind of um, uh, force that traps people in poverty sometimes. So if you're, you know, got plenty of money and uh, you're doing just fine, but you have to navigate sludge, maybe it's going to be bad or maybe you're going to have to hire somebody. But if you're poor, there are two things that make it worse. One is you might well not have a lot of time because you're struggling to make ends meet. It may be that you're dealing with children or parents or pressing need. And if the government tells you, just fill out a four page form, you think, yeah, right. Uh, I don't really have the time for that. And besides, you might think, I might get in trouble if I say something wrong. And that's actually true sometimes. If you say something wrong innocently, there's, there's a risk that there's gonna be a, a tough conversation with the authorities. The other reason for poverty, it's, it's so terrible, the sludge, 
is that if someone who's got good means, let's say, can't get an opportunity because the slide is like a wall, that's unfortunate. But this is a statistic for you. For anti-poverty programs, the tank upgrade is frequently in the range of 40 to 60 percent. And while I was a literature major in college, not a math major, even I know that that means that the non-take up rate is between 40 and 60 percent. Pause over that, if you would. That means that a significant chunk of the eligible population for programs that are designed to help people who are really struggling, the eligible population is not benefit. It's as if the program didn't exist. And that's, you know, that's a horror. That's uh, much worse than uh, a person who's doing fine, having to struggle for an hour and a half with uh, property tax authorities. So a lot of the problem of poverty is a problem first of scarcity, meaning you don't have a lot of time to deal with this stuff, and also of, of, of navigating a system that has a bunch of walls in it that you did not foresee having to encounter when you started on what was supposed to be a simple journey to get something you have a legal right to. It might be job training, it might be uh, an educational opportunity, it might be the earned income tax credit, which has a pretty good take up rate, but there are a lot of people who don't benefit from the earned income tax credit, even though they're eligible. And that's a program that helps uh, poor people and poor children not only survive economically, it helps them with respect to their health, it helps their kids' educational prospects, like many years later, it's a fantastic program, but the sludge makes it much less fantastic than it should be. Uh, another aspect of your book, you know, you write about the, the, the sneaky side of, of sludge, if you will, um, which can sometimes come in the form of manipulative uh, business practices. What are some of the common, the most common ones that people can be on the lookout for? And um, what are the ones you find to be like the most egregious? Okay, so we have a kind of right not to be defrauded or deceived. The law recognizes stuff like that. We don't have a legal right not to be manipulated or not to be sludged. And we should at least be thinking about that. I'll give you a couple of examples. One is if there's an a, a opportunity, let's say, let's call it generously an opportunity, a program where you pay some money and you're entitled to something. Getting in might be like that. Getting out might be impossible or horrible. So to subscribe, and I use the word subscribe broadly, to some things is so easy. And then to unsubscribe is really hard. You have to get through to someone, you have to answer a bunch of questions, you have to be on the line for a long time. So that's one example, easy in, really hard off. And the off hard, it's just there's too much sludge. Another thing that's done sometimes online is that you enter into an agreement of some kind to get something, um, you know, it might be a medicine, it might be uh, some clothing, and it might be a program of some kind. And there's um, a term associated with it, which is you will also pay this. It might be uh, an entry fee, or you will um, also agree to pay, let's say, $30 a month for the insurance benefit or something. And to find out what that term is, it often takes work, it's hidden. And the thing you have to get through to find it is, is sludge. Hidden terms in the world of transportation and the world of vacations are pervasive and airline travel also, there are hidden terms. And, fees. And the data shows that if you require transparency about those things, meaning you desludge the hidden, hiddenness so people just see it, then uh, consumers are a lot better off. 
So to require disclosure, not only of things that, you know, there are allergens here or uh, this product has something that if you take it twice rather than once, something's gonna go wrong. To require also exposure of hidden terms is a way of taking away a form of sludge, which is relative invisibility. So why can't all of those folks just be more transparent? Well, okay, there, there are a couple things. Um, a lack of transparency is sometimes um, kind of inadvertent or an accident where someone says, look, the person's buying uh, an airline ticket. And there's some other things associated with buying an airline ticket, which might be taxes, which might be baggage fees, which might be cancellation fees, rebooking fees. And those aren't really fundamental and we'll let people see them, but we're not gonna shove them in their face because what they wanna do is get from, let's say New York to Los Angeles. And that, let, let's call that the innocent, but frequently we're dealing with something which is, uh, less um, uh, less innocent, where people are thinking, you know, uh, the consumer won't see this term and that, that's okay, that's actually good. Because if the consumer saw this term, the consumer would like this term and the consumer would either protest or not buy the product. So we all know people and sometimes we are those people I'll give, can I give a personal example? I'll give a personal example where a credit card company, a really famous one, a good credit card company, I have the credit card, told me I could subscribe to three magazines for free for three months. And that was really visible. And I thought, that's great. Three magazines for th th free, free for three months? Of course I'll do that. So I subscribed about uh, decades ago to magazines that I didn't like very much, but getting them free, who could lose from that? But after 20 years, which is to say 19 years or nine months after free subscription stopped, I was still receiving these magazines. It was a little amazing that they were still producing these magazines because they weren't very interesting magazines, but I was maybe their only subscriber or part of the small set of people who continue to subscribe, not because they like them, but because they did this thing 20 years ago. It was only once I took a government job and my salary went that I decided to say, I should make a phone call and stop subscribing to these magazines. And it wasn't a very fast phone call, by the way, it took some trouble. But the reason they did that, the, the generally good uh, credit card company in the magazines is they knew something like that would happen. They knew that a lot of people would, would be like me, that after the three months, we wouldn't bother to cancel. They aren't that expensive, the magazines. And we kind of forget that we were paying. And maybe I think I thought, it's still coming. It must be free. <laughs> I didn't bother to check. Mm. Well, you know, to be fair, you know, there's often a purpose to sludge. It's not always to trick consumers. Um, you know, again, as a journalist, I've covered local governments for years, and I've seen how so many like city councils pass legislation that kind of unintentionally creates sludge. Um, I guess, what are some of the necessary reasons for sludge and what are the stated reasons that you think government officials and maybe private companies should think twice about implementing? Okay, it's a great question. So the best reason for sludge is to ensure that people are getting something to which they're entitled. So if you are seeking, let's say a license to do something, chances are you're gonna to have to send in some forms to prove that you're entitled to the license. If you're going to uh, get a permit to build something, let's say in a place where building is controversial and you deserve the permit only if you can meet certain conditions, you're gonna to have to navigate a world of sludge in order to get the permit. If you're saying you're poor or you're saying you're eligible to come into the United States, let's say, for a visa, you have to navigate some sludge to demonstrate that you're entitled. So let's, it sometimes goes by the name of program integrity, and that's a really good reason. 
Another reason is sometimes the government wants to collect data and private sector wants to collect data to make sure that its program or its product is working the way it's supposed to. So it might be a program that's designed to train people to do something and they're collecting information in real time that's pretty irritating to make sure that the program's really working. It might be that they're collecting information with respect to something that bears on health and safety. So employers might be subject to a lot of sludge from the local health authorities, and they might not like it very much, and maybe it's excessive, but there's, there's a good motivation for it to make sure that the workplace is healthy or that workers aren't uh, getting their legs broken. And that may involve a lot of paperwork. So all that is understandable about data collection. It may also be about privacy where a government or a private entity might be able to get access to things about you that uh, could simplify your life. It would just find out either because it has some friend who knows stuff about you, might be another public authority, might be Google, which knows, tends to know a lot about people. But the entity might think, you know, we shouldn't look for private information about people. They should give it over by their consent. And that might mean that they're going to have to fill out some forms that aren't strictly speaking necessary because the information would be available. So privacy, program integrity, and let's call it data collection to make sure that things are performing well, those are all really good reasons. But as a lawyer, I can tell you uh, that my brothers and sisters in the legal profession are sometimes to blame here, where they will pile up the sludge on people particularly, by the way, people who don't have a lot of resources or maybe people who don't, who don't have a lot of good health or who don't have a lot of youth. Those are victims often of sludge. Lawyers will impose it and the lawyers will be thinking, uh, it's easy, I could do it. Um, you're hearing my daughter in the background who's uh, a very uh, good sludge buster. I'm pleased to be able to say. But the lawyers will often say, we should do this just to make sure of X or Y or Z. And the lawyers aren't sufficiently attuned to the harmful effects of the sludge. Wow. Um, and we I, I would be remiss if we didn't recognize um, our friend who's been passing by. Um, what's your dog's name? Oh, you're seeing Finley. OK, Finley okay. is uh, a Labrador retriever. Of uh, great kindness and warmth and very attuned to the sludge he himself imposes when he walks by the camera. Okay. Well, um, on a more serious note, um, you know, we're still in this pandemic and I frankly don't see the beginning of the end um, until like probably 2023. Um, what, what forms of sludge have been most evident to you in the pandemic? Well, I think the most vivid form of sludge is getting vaccinated. So in the early days, a lot of people, including me, found the process of getting an appointment so sludgeful that it was, uh, I love your term about dignity. Now, for me, it wasn't a horrifying digni you know, dignity assault, but for others, you know, who really were scared and vulnerable, it, it was. And so I remember I was trying to get vaccinated in Massachusetts at one point and the screen would helpfully say how long you had to wait. And it said, I had to wait 24 hours and 49 minutes to get vaccinated. Now that's, you know, that's not good. So we've done much better more recently on that, but vaccination sludge is a big problem. Here's another problem. If people are told they have to go in person for something, it might be to get help with a mental health problem, depression or anxiety. It might be to get help with a physical problem. If they're told they have to go into the doctor's office, in a time of pandemic, there are about eight things that are terrible about that. One is that people won't want to go out often. Another is people might want, not want to go out where there are other people. Another is that getting to a doctor physically under current conditions will have a lot of safeguards associated with it, which makes it a more challenging experience than it is in ordinary times. 
which is a windup for the pitch, which is that the sludge that's associated with medical visits has often been eliminated both by ordinary doctor's practices and by the elimination of legal restrictions on telemedicine. And so that's been a terrific uh, response by some, not all in the medical profession, where there's been a lot of creativity in sludge removal because public health demands it. And there are people who have had interview requirements to get things uh, that they're entitled to, in some cases because of poverty, and those interview requirements have been taken away. And state, local, and federal authorities have said, we don't need that interview requirement. I think frequently we've imposed interview requirements more by habit or in, instinct than by full consideration, and it's not necessary to get people in. So for a number of things that are directly related to the pandemic, like health safeguards, and things that are indirectly related, like making it easy and simple for people just by taking sludge requirements away, uh, we've responded at times very well not well enough. Much has been uh, authorized uh, online, which used to be required in person. And it might be there's some sacrifice of uh, safeguard against fraud for some things. Uh, but if we can develop a vaccine and put a person on the moon, maybe we can make our online receipt uh, system sufficiently fraud proof that people won't have to come. Okay. Um, you know, um, you already talked about the, the magazine, the magazines and, you know, a, a little bit of trickery and having you pay for magazine with well, three magazines for what, like, um, I guess 19 years and nine months, <laughs> but, um, you're, you know, you're obviously a prolific author and a scholar, but, you know, you are a regular person um, like everyone else. And I'm wondering um, what other sludge do you encounter in your personal life that like raises your blood pressure? Yeah, I'll tell you, give you a few examples. Not terribly long, speaking of journalism, I wrote a column for a newspaper and they said they'd pay me, not a fortune, but some. And I was grateful for that. But the form was so complicated and so hard that I actually gave up the number of hours I spent trying to fill out the form to get this not huge payment. It was just too terrible and, and I gave up. That was very, very not fun. Um, uh, I'll give a few other examples. Um, just recently, I, I was making three modest changes. I moved from Massachusetts to Washington DC to my cell phone plan and the, uh, the process was, uh, basically close to impossible to deal with the website and I couldn't get a human being to help. And so I, I gave up. Uh, you're hearing my daughter in the background at times, I think. Uh, we're lucky enough to have someone who helps us with our, our daughter and the move from Massachusetts to Washington has required changes in forms that involve nanny tax. And uh, uh, it's, it's beyond me. It's really, it's really hard and I actually have some people who help me, but I think they are half computer and half human and it, they might be, at least when I've been dealing with them the last week, they've been three quarters, there's, there's my daughter, they've been three quarters uh, uh, computer and one quarter human and I haven't managed to be able to get it straight. Now these are things in personal life which aren't horrible in any way, they're just uh, not, not good. But in the work on the book, I encountered, you know, stories that break your heart and uh, make you cry. And that you've obviously worked on that. And if it's the case that someone um, is unable to get something, like a child, that would help them eat nutritiously when they wouldn't otherwise be able to, and the sludge is a wall that separates them from that thing, that's you know, that's more grave than my little travails with the telephone cell service. Yeah, um, well, you know, we're getting some audience questions and um, well, I love how everyone's picking up on the lingo. So the question is how sludgy 
Um, it's the United States versus um, other countries. Um, it's, it's a great question. I can tell you how sludgy the United States is. Uh, I can tell you that the number of hours of paperwork burdens imposed by the US government on the American people is 11 billion, 11 billion. If you turn that into monetary equivalents using standard economic values where an hour is worth 20 or $30, according to the, uh, the official counts on average, the number of hours imposed on the American people crush the bu entire budget of some of our big cabinet departments. If you took everyone in Chicago, a big city where I used to live, and told them, okay, for the next 365 days, you're gonna have to spend every day from basically nine to five filling out federal forms. That would be a violation of the constitution. Uh, but it, the number of hours that you would uh, impose on those Chicagoans, and there are a lot of Chicagoans, wouldn't come close to the 11 billion hours in paperwork the US government imposes on the American people. So it's my hope that um, uh, that action will be taken and is being taken now, and some of it actually is, to cut those 11 billion hours down, partly under the pressure of the pandemic, where the form filling requirements uh, look absurd. And the idea of requiring someone to fill out a form that has 72 questions is scrutinized, really, in a pandemic, that's what they're gonna have to do. And my hope also is that uh, state and local officials in the United States will take a very hard look at sludge. I have a little term for this, it's called sludge audits. And the idea is that institutions of all kinds, uh, hospitals, universities, nonprofits, big companies, little companies, should be doing formal or informal sludge audits in which they ask, what's the amount of sludge we're imposing in a week? And you can be really, you know, you can add up the hours or you can just have an approximation. And the beauty of a sludge audit is once you do one, you'll probably think, what are we doing here? This is crazy. Customers, employees, our colleagues are spending this amount of time on forms and waiting and going from one place to another. Uh, so my hope is that not only the United States, but other countries that are big sludge generators will do sludge audits. And I can say I've talked about the concept of sludge with other nations. I'm now working for the US government and basically only talked to my colleagues within the US government. When I was uh, a civilian, I would talk to people in other countries, a lot of them, and there wasn't one in which the problem of sludge did not resonate. In fact, the idea of sludge in some nations seems so um, uh, uh, relevant to why there's malfunction and dysfunction there that the thought was we need to get on it soon and uh, that's starting to happen. Um, and you know, well, you know, we've talked today about um, how you know there are reasons for sludge, and then sometimes it's you know a lot of times it gets out of control. And so, like, at what point can you begin to differentiate between what's necessary um, and just part of the bureaucratic process, and what becomes detrimental? Okay. Where where does that where's that line? I give a couple examples. So. Um, there's something called the, the FAFSA form, the free application for student aid, it's so poor kids can get to college. And the FAFSA form, or university, and the FAFSA form is really complicated. There was a study a number of years ago that showed that if you simplify the form, you have the same impact in getting poor kids to get to go to college as you would if you added to the financial subsidy thousands of dollars. So the goal is to get more poor kids a chance to go to higher education. Two things, simplify the form, give each of them several thousands of dollars. The, the more appealing, I think, is simplify the form because then you don't have to spend more money. Now that data, it took a long time, but it spurred first an effort in the Obama administration 
to do what could be done to simplify the form within the confines of the law, and it was significant. And then very recently to do something which had bipartisan approval, eventually it took a long time, which is to reduce the legal requirements on the form. And the, the idea there was that it was just so palpable that to get the information you needed to know if someone qualified for financial aid, you didn't need to have them uh, run an obstacle course or do the triathlon. All they had to do was answer a few simple questions. So that's, that's one example. Another example from the US government is that not terribly long ago, truck drivers at the end of the day had to fill out forms about their vehicle to make sure the truck was fine. And they'd end their day, let's say it's six o'clock, they'd fill out the form. Then the next morning, they had to fill out exactly the same form. That's, that's crazy. They, nothing had happened to the truck. They, they just slept. The truck sat there in the driveway. And so scrutiny proved that the duplication of the form was not serving any purpose. And the government said, okay, you don't have to fill out the form if there's no driving in the interim. And that was a huge benefit for truck drivers. I'll give you a third example, which is from the US government in real time, that's today, uh, which is that the, the part of the Department of Homeland Security where I'm working, the people who are in charge of immigration uh, issued a federal register notice in which they said, uh, please American public and international public, everyone, tell us about the uh, barriers and burdens that the immigration system is erecting, such that maybe you're a small company trying to hire someone, maybe you are trying to get a green card, maybe you're a doctor or nurse trying to help people, maybe you're in a university, maybe you're an employer trying to get someone in. Tell us about the barriers and burdens that are not justified. And the number of comments was expected by many to be in the dozens for sure, probably hundreds, um, but over 7,400 comments came in with people who are exposed to sludge saying this is pointless or excessive. And uh, that enterprise of asking people, actually asking people, what is the sludge that you're facing and what seems to you not to make sense. Now, if someone says, I don't like this form, they might not be right, but ask them, treat them with respect and dignity. And much of the time you'll learn something and much of the time you'll learn they're right, the form's excessive, or maybe they don't need it at all. So for a private institution, I've done this a little bit with private companies, uh, not big ones, but private institutions just to ask customers and employers. It can be informal. Employees, what, what's 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 bugging you about the administrative burdens? And then they'll and then and it's like a a gift. They'll tell you five things, and then the employees will be happier, and the customers will be happier. The company will do better. And in a free country you know, that aspires to self-government to ask people about what is in the domain of education or in the domain of uh, benefits for people who need them or uh, job opportunities. What, what, is, what is like a wall? And can we, that's a wall we can tear down. Well, you know, um, you know, we talked about how sludge can disproportionately affect um, people from low-income households. Um, I worked on um, some of our ADA coverage last year, and um, I know that um, a lot of people who had um, physical disabilities told us that, you know, for years they were told, well, you need to come into the office or you need to do, you know, like it, everything had to be in person. And now, everything's virtual and they're like, my life is so much better. And like, why couldn't you have done that for me? Um, so I'm wondering, you know, how can um, technology, you know, even beyond virtual events like this, virtual meetings like this, um, how can um, technology reduce um, rather than increase sludge? And that's from our audience. It's a fantastic question. Thank you for that. And the example given about people with disabilities, it's perfect. So if your legs don't work, 
you know, to get from one place to another might be very challenging. Um, there are technologies that help with that, but if you can do it online, it might be uh, a transformation for the better person's life. So the technologies, I think, are mostly opportunity, though partly a, a challenge. Uh, they're opportunity in the sense that if it's the case that someone, let's say, who's facing, you know, struggling with cancer or heart disease, uh, to go somewhere is not welcome and is maybe risky. Uh, the online opportunity is fantastic. And sometimes the online technologies, if they're done right, they can be really simple to navigate so that if there are questions that aren't relevant to you, you can just say that and then they'll skip 10 of them. And so the form, which might be really confusing if it's paper online will be really simple. Uh, the difficulty with online, I think, is twofold, and this is a work in progress for our society. Some people don't have access to online, and they don't know how to do it, even if they know how to get on, they don't wouldn't know how to fill out a form. So we need to make accommodations for people who, for one or another reason, find it challenging. And also, sometimes the designers of uh, websites are um, not meeting people where they are. They're meeting people where the designers are. And the designers might find something, it's a little like when you're, you're in a town that's new and you say, how do I get to the ATM? And someone says, go straight one mile, turn left, you'll see a courthouse. Then it's Kitty Corner. I don't know what Kitty Corner exactly means, by the way, though people have given me uh, directions have often said that. So it's Kitty Corner. And then they'll say, and then there's a red house on the right. It's, and then they say the ATM's across the street. You can't miss it. And, and I always miss it when they say that. Um, when they do that, I think they're not usually being cruel. <laughs> they're actually trying to be helpful. And sometimes online website designers, designers are, are, are like the people telling you, you can't miss it. It's that they're so familiar with the, the website that they are themselves designing, that navigating it seems like for them a breeze, but it's not for people who are encountering it the first time. And, and that's really a work in progress. There's a, a book I love uh, very, very much. It's called Don't Make Me Think. And it's about website design. And the designer says that is basically your mantra. You, you want uh, someone to visit the website, not to have to think. It's just like walking or breathing. And that, that's pretty ambitious to make it that easy. But many websites, and you can take your pick, are uh, sludge free, pretty much, in the sense that they, they, they just work for how the human mind works. Uh, those that aren't are defeating their own purpose, which is to make it, you know, a simple experience for people who often, in cases of need, uh, depend on something that's really transparent to them. Well, you know, speaking of um, how um, web designers design the pages the way they would like and might not necessarily think about folks like me who, you know, aren't as tech savvy. Um, you know, you talked about your brothers and sisters in the law profession. Um, and one of the audience questions is how much sludge is caused by the fact that we live in a litigious society um, in the United States? Do we just love piling paperwork on each other? Like, it's, okay. it's just in our nature in the United States? It's a fantastic question. I'll give you a two-part answer. One is a story, start with a story. So when I worked for President Obama, he was very much behind what I came to late, which was let's reduce paperwork burdens on the American public. He, he thought that was a good idea. And so we did some stuff on that. And I have to say that for many of our efforts, uh, the lawyers were not um, uh, the most willing accomplices. That is, they would say, look, uh, we need to get this form in and it needs to be long in order for us to comply with the law. 
There's a terrible term, I'll tell you, litigation risk. There's a litigation risk if we simplify the form. And so I think there are two things going on there. One is that the lawyers are often uh, too risk averse, I think, with respect to the small possibility that someone's gonna sue. That's kind of our job as lawyers, but maybe too risk averse. And the other is to the, to the questioner's point, the fact that we are as litigious as we are makes lawyers very cautious about, um, about removing stuff. If there's some argument that removing it is gonna give rise to a possibly successful lawsuit. So that's my story. Um, and so for that's the story as I'm obliged to do. As a used to be professor, we have to have footnotes to our story. But, uh, but here's the little um, thought, which has data behind it. If there's a problem in any of our lives, uh, we think typically, what do we add to the situation so as to solve the problem? So if there are five little ingredients in something that we're facing, in our home life, in our jobs, and the five ingredients seem not to be solving it, we think, well, why don't we add six and seven? And, and then it'll be better. I know that's how my mind works, and that's typically how the human mind works. But often the better approach is to say, what if instead of the five elements, we take two away? Maybe then it would be and there's actually a, an excellent book out which has the title Less, which is in some ways a uh, cousin of, of my book Sludge. And it really documents and goes to town with this idea, our minds keep thinking more, but they ought to be thinking less, take things away. So, okay, so let's talk about the problem of uh, poverty and the problem of, um, of mental illness. Um, to think with respect to people who are struggling with either, what do we add to their situations? That could be a good thought, but for the people who are poor and struggling with mental illness, there's a lot going on in their lives. How can we make it easier for them? Instead of piling up requirements, that might be the worst thing to do if we aim to help them. So for, if you want to help poor people become independent, to pile up requirements on them to engage with bureaucracy, that's, that's not gonna help. It might just make them feel that they've been treated disrespectfully and also not have time to do other things and also decide as I did with one recent effort to navigate a sludge pervaded process, they might just give up and say, this, this won't work for me. Right, and that goes back to um, what you were saying about the fact that, um, I guess at the beginning you were saying that um, what it was like 40%, I can't remember if it's 40% do not get the services that they need or 60%, whichever it's bad, um, but it should be 100. No, that's great. Often the take up rate is 40 to 60%. By mm -hmm. contrast with the social security system, the take up rate is way high. And that's not an accident. It's because the social security system has minimal sludge associated with them. So to mm -hmm. get social security, it's not a nightmare. It's not really hard. And it, 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 there should be less sludge almost always, including there. But social security basically is a big winner for sludge. Many other programs just aren't. And that means that millions of people aren't getting something to which they're entitled. Can I tell you about one sludge reduction effort that I had some involvement in that it's, it's the only thing I was involved in under the Obama administration that I have a hard time talking about without crying. And I'm gonna to try to get through it. <laughs> Wish me luck, would you? Um, there's a program we have, it's uh, designed to give poor kids uh, free lunches and breakfasts. And it's nutritious meals for poor children. Now, I just use words. If you think for your mo moment, uh, if, if you saw on screen, let's say 12 poor kids who want to eat and they're poor and they want to eat healthy. And if they can eat something for free, that's phenomenal. Okay, here's the problem. A lot of families whose kids are eligible for those meals, don't sign them up. 
that's been the, the, the history. Now, I don't know exactly why, having investigated it, some of uh, the forms aren't the simplest to sign up. Um, if you're poor and you get a notice from the government, you might be scared. It might be something that seems like a threat rather than opportunity. It might be they're just really busy and a lot of stuff comes in the mail and this looks like a form letter. In any case, there's a human tragedy there that lots of kids aren't getting meals to which they're entitled. And so what we did was we used a program called the Direct Certification Program, which allows localities and schools to say to the kids, you're in the program, you don't have to sign up because we know you're eligible. No one has to do anything, you're in. If you don't want these meals, you don't have to take them. You can bring whatever your family wants, but you are entitled, here you go. At last count, 15 million American children were benefiting from this program, including homeless kids. And that now I'm gonna to have to steady myself. 15 million kids is a statistic. But we're talking about a sludge removal, which is producing every one of those kids has a face and we're producing a much better life for every one of them, not by throwing more money at a problem, not by a public education campaign, but by taking the sludge away. Yeah, I can tell you um, as a child who um, received those free and reduced lunches, you know, there's also a stigma, but, you know, just now I'm thinking one of the biggest sludge removals um, that I can think of personally, it's like going from that food stamp um, book to like an EBT card, um, you know, still have to, fill out all the paperwork, but um, yeah, that's definitely, I think, uh, an example of removing sludge. Um, yeah, about stigma. So there, there are ways of running programs, you know, not endorsing any particular initiative, but if everyone gets a free school meal, then there's no stigma. Everyone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so there are several more questions, um, but we're running out of time. Um, one is, uh, I guess maybe we should talk about some solutions. One, someone wanted to know, do you consider tax codes and regulatory codes to be sludge? And, you know, then how should Congress go about fixing this? And my question is just how should we fix sludge, period? I mean, I know that's very broad and you're not Superman, but. Well, um... It depends on what one's role is. So when I was um, well, I'm on leave from my university, but I made some pleas to the administrators, P-L-E-A-S, not P-L-E-A-S-E. I, I begged them to take sludge away from students in particular. And I worked a little bit with our uh, university health services uh, leadership. Uh, to explore taking sludge away. So, so for any institution that can be done. Um, if we are you know, uh, subject to an institution, we can ask, might you not do this or do this less frequently? Or if we're, we're part of us at some point in life are, uh, we can say, let's have this as an enterprise, sludge reduction. And that, that can do it a customer can complain to say that you're putting too much sludge here. So wherever we are as uh, you know, dealing with a school, if you have young kids, as everyone knows, I have one, I actually have two, you only heard one, the other one's quiet or he's at baseball, but the, the, there's a lot of sludge about being a parent and to ask schools or others, can you, can you reduce it a little bit? That, that can be helpful. And what I'm thinking a little bit is the project of sludge reduction is so large that it may be, be daunting. It's often not possible or generally not possible to change the world, but you can often ch change someone's world. And maybe that's way into the sludge problem. But uh, Cass, we had a whole, or we have a whole paperwork reduction act, right? When was that um, enacted? How many years has it been now? 
Okay, so it was enacted, I believe, in 1980. Mm. That's not an exciting fact, meaning it's a long time ago. The fact that we have uh, 11 billion hours of paperwork imposed on the American people, that's excessive. I think that's really excessive, but uh, it would probably be a lot higher without the Paperwork Reduction Act. I know there are a lot of efforts to acquire information that run into a brick wall in the form of the Paperwork Reduction Act. That never makes the newspaper, but it happens. And the fact is that there's an opportunity for anyone in, in who's in a position of authority from the president to someone at a much lower level to use the Paperwork Reduction Act. It's a little like freedom of speech or the Equal Protection Clause. It's there, it's available, and it can be turned into something. Is there anything, um, you know, I guess, what's the most important um, what do you want people to come away um, with after reading your after reading your book? Which I will tell folks, um, it's a very um, accessible um, book. I was a little, um, I was like, oh, is this going to be daunting because it's going to be policy? Um, but um, I think, you know, if you don't read all of the, um, uh, you know, all of the research that's in the back, you did a lot of research. Um, it's only 110 pages. I'm like, oh, yeah, this is great. Um, so, uh, you know, what do you want readers to come away with? Okay, the, the, if we think maybe at any point, but especially in 2021, uh, uh, as you say, the pandemic isn't almost over. What's the most precious thing that human beings have? What's the one thing that we're luckiest to have? I, th I think it's a four letter word and it's time. Let's find, shall we, ways to give other people more of it. Oh my goodness. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, it's getting me uh, teary-eyed. So, um, you know, we have to close here and thank you again, Cass, for our conversation tonight. And I wanna thank um, Zocalo for, um, and the Public Pacific Council for uh, presenting this conversation and to everyone in our audience out there, you guys ask great questions. Um, Cass's book is Sludge and you can find it at um, a link below. And there's going to be a summary of this conversation on the website um, by tomorrow. And you can also listen on the podcast. If you enjoy this event, um, be sure to join again next week. Um, oh no, not next week, I'm sorry. Next, it's gonna be, Wednesday, September 29th, and um, the topic is, will a new generation of leaders shake up LA's culture? Wow. So subscribe to the newsletter for updates. Um, and again, Cass, thank you so much. Um, I've really enjoyed this conversation and, um, you know, down with paperwork. I don't want to fill out anything. Um, you know, can you solve like the IRS? Is there something else that we can do? Like, why are the tax forms so laborious? What's the problem? Why? It's a very good question and uh, let's work on it. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, good night, everyone. Thank you.